Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Matt Roth with Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation. Uh, the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium is an NIH Common Fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Heather Pua, from the University of California, San Francisco. The title of her presentation is Extracellular RNA and Vesicles in Allergic Lung Inflammation. Heather? Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, having me. I'm uh, really happy to be sharing uh, the work I've been doing in Mark Ansel's lab looking at extracellular RNA and vesicles uh, in the lung. So the outline of the talk today is I'm going to give you just a little bit of brief background about allergic airways disease and um, uh, what is known about vesicles and microRNAs in the bronchialveolar lavage fluid during inflammatory conditions. Then I'll present some data talking about the RNA composition of BAL and some microRNA sequencing results we have. A little bit about preliminary work we've done to try to discern what forms these microRNAs might be occurring in, lipoproteins, protein complexes, and or vesicles. And then a system that we're using to try to track the cellular origin of extracellular vesicles in the lung in vivo. So, uh, the disease that we're interested in studying um, is allergic lung disease, and this is basically asthma. And I think it's always a good idea to uh, think about what uh, is sort of the burden of disease which you're studying. So this is a representation of the prevalence of big, broad classes of disease in the United States. And you can see here, marked in blue, is the prevalence of all cancer. And in orange is the prevalence of all autoimmune disease. And in yellow, actually, this is only asthma. So 7 to 10% of the population is affected by asthma. This is a huge problem um, and requires a lot of healthcare expenditure and uh, is associated with a lot of morbidity. Uh, asthma is, in fact, the most common chronic lung disease globally. It affects 300 million um, people around the world. Uh, it does also lead to death, so 250,000 deaths per year. Clinically, asthma is defined by reversible airflow obstruction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, airway inflammation, and in the context of long-standing airway inflammation, there is also airway remodeling. Asthma is quite a heterogeneous disease, and the type of asthma which we are going to talk about modeling today is the so-called TH2 high endotype. And this really models a group of patients who have asthma and also are characterized by atopy or allergic responses, high levels of eosinophils or eosinophilia, and uh, production of the cytokine IL-13. So during allergic lung inflammation, an allergen really induces a profound uh, inflammatory response in the lung as well as stromal changes. So upon allergen exposure, there's a recruitment of a group of innate and adaptive inflammatory cells uh, that constitute a type 2 inflammatory process. Again, one of the hallmarks of this inflammation is an eosinophil. And this is driven in large part by um, T cells of the Th2 or T helper 2 type lineage. Uh, this inflammation then leads to a reactive changes in both the epithelium and the stroma. And here I'm just depicting one of those changes. And this is mucous metaplasia of the bronchial epithelium here and here. And on the bottom, you can actually see histologic sections from my mice. On the left-hand side, you can see a normal airway epithelium underlined by alveolar spaces. And in the context of allergic inflammation, you can see a dense band of inflammatory cells that are infiltrating into the space, as well as mucous metaplasia, which is really highlighted by this magenta staining. So the question that we've been interested in asking is really what are the composition, forms, and cellular sources of extracellular RNAs, both at steady state in the lung as well as during allergic lung inflammation? And I think it's not hard to imagine that there could be quite profound changes in both the forms and types of um, RNAs present because we have infiltration of a new cell population with this type 2 inflammatory response, as well as big changes in the cells that are present, 
Uh, this may lead to different RNAs being secreted or different forms of those RNAs being secreted. Uh, today we're going to talk mostly about results in the bronchialveolar lavage, though we're obviously also interested long term whether any of these changes are also present in circulation in the serum. So what is really known about vesicles and microRNAs in the BAL? Uh, not a lot, um, although there have been a few human studies trying to begin to characterize extracellular vesicles and RNAs in this biofluid. So there are a few papers that have suggested that there may be an increase in exosome-associated markers by bead-based flow cytometry in pulmonary diseases, including both asthma and sarcoidosis. Uh, and typically, these exosome-associated markers were seen in 100,000 GBAL pellets. Uh, these were markers that include CD63, CD81, as well as a number of uh, uh, different markers, not necessarily exosome-associated, such as MHC class 2 um, and scavenger receptors. There's also been shown that there are some differences in the microRNA content of the 100,000 GBAL pellet between healthy controls and asthmatic patients. Uh, a paper in 2013 identified a 16 microRNA signature that was associated with asthma. And interestingly, the levels of these microRNAs correlated with the functional status of patients and their FEV1, which is a measure of ability to exhale air. Finally, 100,000 GBAL pellets from patients with asthma and sarcoid can induce enhanced cytokine production from lung epithelial and inflammatory cells and cultures. And this begins to point towards a possible functional role for extracellular vesicles and perhaps their RNA contents in lung inflammation. So the first question we began to ask was, um, what is the microRNA composition in bronchialveolar lavage? This is the model system that we use to study allergic airways uh, in our mice. So throughout the uh, rest of the presentation, you'll see mice that are um, labeled or results that are labeled AA, and that stands for allergic airways condition. In this condition, we have sensitized our mice with interperitoneal injections for ovalbumin, which is our model antigen, with an adjuvant alum. They get sensitized once a week for three weeks. And then they're challenged by aspiration of the antigen alone, ovalbumin, for three sequential days. And lungs and BAL fluid are harvest, harvested then on the fourth day. There are two different types of controls for experiments. Some mice which have been immunized interperitoneally but are not challenged in the lung. So there'll be no local inflammation in the lung. And some mice who have been neither immunized nor challenged. And those are our control mice group. So we decided to collect four different types of specimens for microRNA sequencing from mice either that were control or had been um, had induced allergic airways. We bled these mice for serum. Um, these were prepared in serum separator tubes, spun for five minutes, and typically returned about 200 microliters per mouse. We also did epithelial brushings in the lungs of our mice um, and to collect a enriched epithelial group of cells. These brushings were placed directly into trizol. Finally, we did one mil cold PBS washes for our bronchialveolar lavage fluid. We typically return uh, about 800 to 900 microliters of fluid. Uh, we did a low speed spin to separate out inflammatory cell pellets from the BAL fluid supernatant. And then these two specimens were both independently sequenced. Uh, in all cases, we isolated total RNA and performed uh, or generated libraries uh, using an adaptive protocol. Uh, we have added five ends to our adapters to eliminate ligation bias. We use the excerpt small RNA pipeline on Jimbury then to process. This is just an example of bioanalyzer tracings from the RNA that we obtained for each specimen. So as you can see in both the BAL fluid and the serum, 
we see predominantly small RNA species that are present in these fluids and no large ribosomal subunits. Uh, whereas in our BAL cells, as well as our epithelial brushings, which are cell pellet RNAs, uh, you can see both the 28 and 18S ribosomal subunits. This is a principal component analysis uh, showing us variants in our data sets. And as you can see and would likely expect, that the samples cluster predominantly by type. So all of the serum samples will cluster together. All of the inflammatory cell pellets from the BAL cluster together, and the epithelium cluster together cluster together. Interestingly, the bronchialveolar lavage fluid and the epithelium seem to cluster quite closely in our um, microRNA data. In addition, you can see that there is some variance, uh, consistent variance between um, our allergic airways, which is here in yellow, uh, as well as our control groups, which are represented by blue. To further compare our data sets, we uh, looked at Pearson correlation coefficients. And consistent with the principal component analysis, you can see that there's quite a tight correlation when you compare the microRNA expression in epithelium and the BAL fluid. This is true both in control as well as allergic airway conditions. There is additionally some correlation between our inflammatory cell pellets uh, as well uh, to our BAL, though the correlation is not quite as tight with an R of 0.7. These are the top microRNAs that we saw in all conditions by specimen type. And you can see that um, commonly high expressed microRNAs are present in our expression set. And there are many microRNAs that are shared between BAL fluid, BAL cells, as well as lung epithelium. To do a more detailed uh, analysis, we uh, made volcano plots to compare the log two fold change of microRNAs between our allergic airway and control conditions. And when we look in the BAL, there are a group of microRNAs that are significantly upregulated in the BAL in allergic airway inflammation. Uh, these most prominently include MIR 223 as well as MIR 142, uh, also include MIR 92A, as well as the, some additional microRNAs. These two most highly um, induced microRNAs were quite interesting to us because both of these microRNAs have important roles in inflammatory cells, and both of them have been linked with components of type 2 inflammation. And indeed, when we used volcano plots to compare the expression of microRNAs in allergic airways uh, between our uh, cell pellets, which are composed predominantly of inflammatory cells, versus our epithelium, you can see that MIR-223 and MIR-142A are more highly expressed in our inflammatory cell pellets than in our epithelium. This strongly suggests to us that perhaps these two microRNAs are originating from inflammatory cells that are infiltrating into the lung during allergic inflammation. We've also done some analysis of serum, and when we compare the microRNA expression in serum between allergic airway disease and control, uh, we actually do not see upregulation of the same microRNAs that we see in the BAL, and there are relatively fewer changes in the serum microRNA profile in the context of allergic inflammation. So what about the forms that these microRNAs might be taking in the BAL? So we all know that extracellular RNAs are present in multiple forms, um, and that these forms are packaged or exported from the cell uh, through different mechanisms and can include both vesicular and non-vesicular forms. 
So we really um, have begun to look at whether these microRNAs could be present in the BAL, either in association with lipoprotein particles, represented on top here, in protein complexes, particularly in complexes with argonaut protein, or in extracellular vesicles. This is work we did in collaboration with the Refai Lab, um, which is part of our uh, U19 group, and looking at uh, HDL in the BAL. So on the far right-hand side, you can actually see this is an enriched fraction for HDL, HDL and you can see APOA1 and APOC expression here. Uh, in the BAL, there is some uh, HDL particles with some APOA1 and APOC. Um, both control and immunized, which is another form of control mice, look fairly similar. There seems to be a reduction in HDL in the context of allergic inflammation. We tried to investigate whether our most highly induced microRNA, MIR-223, might be associated um, with this HDL fraction. We compared um, control, immunized, and allergic airways mice. Um, the 100,000 G supernatant or the enriched HDL fraction, and we do not see any preferential enrichment of MIR-223 in allergic airways in an HDL fraction. This suggests to us that perhaps the microRNAs that we're seeing upregulated during allergic inflammation are not associated with lipoprotein particles. We've also tried to do immunoprecipitations of argonaut from BAL fluid. On the left-hand side, you can see a lymph node lysate and immunoprecipitation, showing that we can successfully immunoprecipitate argonaut. Consistent with published uh, results, we cannot uh, detect uh, argonaut in lymph node lysate, or sorry, serum lysate, but we can immunoprecipitate it from serum. However, when we try to immunoprecipitate uh, Argonaut from either BAL of mice um, without or with airway inflammation, we're really not able to immunoprecipitate any free argonaut. So at least as of now, we've not been able to detect argonaut complexes in the BAL, similar to what's seen in the serum. We've also done particle counts uh, using the nanosite to look for um, the number as well as the size of particles to ask the question of whether they may change in the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid with allergic lung inflammation. As you can see on the left-hand side, uh, in control immunized and allergic airways mice, we see no difference in the number of particles per input ml of BAL. And when we look at the size distribution of these particles, uh, we see no difference in their size distribution. In all cases, they seem to be uh, have a median distribution slightly above 100 nanometers in size. So we don't see any changes in uh, allergic inflammation in this measure. We're currently trying to continue to characterize our vesicles. Um, we're doing electron microscopy to view our vesicle morphology. Um, and uh, setting up Western blots to look for exosome markers um, and other markers that might characterize vesicles in the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid. So what about the cellular sources of extracellular vesicles in the BAO? So we have been um, similar to some other groups, trying to develop protocols for doing flow cytometry for vesicles. And we have been using the Cytoflex machine to detect vesicles um, as individual particles. And we, uh, I'm showing you here some uh, data we have with beads to show that cy the Cytoflex can, in fact, detect particles down to 100 nanometers. Uh, on the left-hand side is the Megamix forward beads, and you can see that particles are detected between 100 nanometers and 900 nanometers in size with discrimination between individual sizes. Uh, the size is on the um, y-axis and is indicated by violet side scatter. You'll also notice that there's quite a lot of background, um, and this is always true on the Cytoflex for us despite filtering. Um, 
So we really need a fluorescent signal to pull um, these small particles out of the background and be able to detect down to 100 nanometers in size. On the right-hand side is just another set of beads of slightly different size, again, showing you that we can detect fairly small um, particles using the Cytoflex instrument. Because we really knew that um, we could only detect particles using the Cytoflex down to a small size with fluorescent signal, we wanted to develop an, um, a mouse model where we could potentially label extracellular vesicles in vivo. And to do this, we've been using MTMG, an MTMG reporter mouse as our tool. So this mice, the, uh, these mice normally express an MTMG construct where the tomato is expressed followed by a polyadenylation stop and uh, membrane-bound GFP is not expressed. However, in the uh, presence of Cree recombinase, the tomato is excised and uh, GFP is expressed. On the right-hand side, you can see an example from the published literature just showing you that there can be tissue-specific expression here using a nest and pre reporter um, highlighting um, cells in green in the CNS. Oh, and um, in the bottom, you can see the conversion from red to green through a yellow intermediary um, when uh, ER cre mice are treated with tamoxifen. Because this is supposed to label all Membranes, we were hopeful that perhaps this would also label extracellular vesicles. And indeed, we could detect in these mice fluorescently labeled vesicles present in the BAL. So on the top, we have our MTMG mice. These mice should express, have every cell expressing membrane-bound tomato. And indeed, on the left, you can see um, some tomato-positive vesicles, um, but no GFP-positive vesicles. Conversely, when we cross the MTMG mice to actin -cre to switch all cells from expressing membrane tomato to membrane GFP, you can see no longer do we detect any uh, tomato-positive vesicles, uh, but now we are detecting GFP-positive particles. We did some testing to try to convince ourselves that what we were actually looking at were uh, vesicles. And to do this, we tried to lyse the vesicles with detergents. So this is an MTMG mouse um, without, with uh, actin Cre. So basically, all vesicles are GFP positive on the right-hand side. Uh, when you add either SDS or tween, you can see the total loss of the MGFP signal suggesting that indeed what we're detecting are vesicles. We've also done protonase K digestion to see whether we can eliminate uh, the fluorescent signal if perhaps it's part of protein aggregates. Once again, these are um, MTMG mice crossed to actin Cre, so um, all cells are expressing uh, GFP rather than tomato. Uh, you can see here that even after 40 minutes of protonase K treatment, we still see a pretty robust uh, MGFP positive particle fraction, uh, suggesting that, that we are not just detecting protein aggregates. So we really wanted to use this tool to test some of the uh, origins of vesicles in the lung. And we've been doing that using two different crees, so to help us label epithelium and inflammatory cells. On the left-hand side, you can see a picture showing you the expression of GFP in our MTMG NKX 2.1 Cree mouse. NKX 2.1 Cree is a transcription factor that's expressed early in uh, lung epithelial development and should label all lung epithelial cells. And indeed, you can see bronchial epithelium now is labeled by GFP. You can also probably see some type 2 pneumocytes. And it's hard to tell in the picture, but indeed, the walls of the alveoli have turned yellow here uh, from the green GFP staining of the type 1 alveolar epithelium. We've also used a VAVCRE uh, promoter in a second line. And this uh, VAVCRE is expressed in all hematopoietic cells. So this allow allows us to label with GFP hematopoietic cells. Here you can see some individual alveolar macrophage, which are trolling in the alveolar spaces, as well as a few inflammatory cells which have uh, come out of this vessel and are infiltrating between um, two bronchioles. 
At steady state, it appears that the vesicles in the BAL actually originate mostly from um, epithelial origin, although there are also some from hematopoietic cells. So once again, uh, this is actually pregated on all fluorescence positive particles. You can see that in MTMG mice without Cre, uh, none of the particles or vesicles are expressing GFP. In actin Cre, all of them are expressing GFP. In our MTMG NKX 2.1 Cre mouse, uh, you can see that approximately 75% of the vesicles are now labeled with GFP, suggesting that they are coming from an epithelial origin. Uh, whereas uh, only about 10% or slightly less than 10% are labeled in our VAVCRE mice and appear to be coming from hematopoietic origin. When we um, quantitate this over a number of experiments, we can see that uh, there, uh, again, the vast majority of MGFP positive or of uh, NKX 2.1 Cre are MGFP positive, suggesting that they're coming from lung epithelial origin, and this correlates to a count of about 10 to the 7th uh, particles per ml of BAL. Uh, there are about an order of magnitude less MTMG VAV Cre positive um, vesicles, uh, but still they're detectable above background. So what happens during allergic lung inflammation? This is uh, work that continues to be in progress. So on the left-hand side, we are looking at the percentage of MGFP positive uh, as a percentage of total fluorescent positive vesicles. And in the closed boxes, we see uh, mice that have been immunized but not challenged. And in the open uh, symbols, we see mice that are both immunized and challenged, so have allergic airway inflammation. What you can see is that by percentages, we actually don't see a large change in the percentage of vesicles that appear to be originating from hematopoietic or epithelial origin. However, when we look at the cell count or the uh, vesicle counts, you can see that there's about a two-fold increase in the number of vesicles from uh, VAV-CRE positive cells in the context of allergic lung inflammation. So um, in conclusion, I think that the work we've done so far has shown that microRNAs in the BAL do change during allergic responses, and we hypothesize that this change is due to the influx of inflammatory cells which secrete new microRNAs into the extracellular space. We hypothesize that most extracellular microRNAs in the BAL are carried in vesicle form, um, and that it is possible to detect extracellular vesicles in BAL by flow cytometry. Uh, and our in vivo cell origin labeling really suggests that most EVs in the BAL originate from lung epithelium, but that there is an increase in EVs from inflammatory cells um, in the allergic lungs. In the future, we're uh, interested in determining which microRNAs are present, present in the EVs in BAL at steady state and during allergic inflammation. Uh, we should, are interested in characterizing EVs and allergic inflammation more in detail. Uh, we'd like to do additional cell of origin tracing with our MTMG reporter mice. And we've been trying to work on antibody staining of these labeled EVs to get more detail uh, at a single vesicle resolution. And uh, of course, we're interested long-term in what the function of these EVs and microRNAs are from epithelium and hematopoietic sources in allergic asthma. So finally, I'd like to thank my PI, Mark Ansel, um, for his support in this project. Uh, Hannah Happ is an excellent um, tech who I've been working on this project with, uh, as well as our funding sources, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Heather. Very nice. Any questions? Uh, this is Kevin Halcroft. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned early on that two of the more highly expressed RNAs or microRNAs, 223 and 142, I think you indicated that those were from inflammatory cells? 
Yeah, we, we certainly hypothesize that they're from inflammatory cells because we can see them upregulated in our inflammatory cell pellets in, in allergic inflammation, and they are known to be fairly highly expressed in hematopoietic cells and have important roles. Um, we're interested in trying to prove that, although that's quite difficult to do, and we've been thinking about using um, bone marrow chimera approaches to try to determine whether that 223 or 142 that arrives in the extracellular space is actually coming from a hematopoietic origin. Right, so I was trying to, to compare that to the fact that most of the vesicles you see are from the epithelium. They are. Which, which could mean that either the, the, the smaller portion of vesicles from immune cells are, are loaded with microRNAs, or that there are some reports where microRNAs can be passed from one cell to another and exported in a vesicle, and so I was wondering if you could use your red and green fluorescent exosomes to try to sort out where these microRNAs are located, you know, are from the epithelial cells or from the immune cells, and try to figure out where they're, you know, how they're getting out into the into the uh, airway space. Yeah, I think those are great suggestions and would be really interesting to investigate. And I think using tools like this to be able to actually identify where a vesicle is coming might point us towards, you know, functionally important um, either cargo or mechanisms for secreting these extracellular vesicles. And if this, if this, so just a, a, a second question. Are, are, are you surprised at all that the number of vesicles during inflammation doesn't go up even more so than what you see? Um, I, I say I, I am kind of surprised. I was sort of hoping that maybe we would see, you know, five or tenfold increase in the number of vesicles and in inflammation. But you have to re remember that probably it's a, it's a dynamic process. So the, it could be that the flux of vesicles does increase, but that perhaps okay. cells are also taking them up very quickly. We yeah. probably need other tools to kind of address that question, um, but I, I, I agree. I think I, I sort of expected that we would be able to see bulk changes. Yeah, I, I was also thinking that maybe the up, the uptake may be increased as well, and if there were ways to look for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, Heather, this is uh, Matt Roth. Uh, could you just expand a little bit on maybe what you're expecting to see, like in your follow-up for future directions, you mentioned uh, additional cell of origin studies. Uh, so you're looking at, in terms of hematopoiesis there, hematopoietic cells, you're looking at different subsets, what might you expect, or is that what you yeah, comment on exactly. that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's what we're interested in. So in the field of immunology, we have a lot of great um, crees that are driven in uh, hematopoietic subset-specific fashion, so we can uh, have CRE reporters that are driving only in T cells or B cells or myeloid lineage cells, eosinophils. And this actually would allow us to try to subsegment that 10% and see whether most of the vesicles are being secreted by myeloid or lymphoid cells. Um, it may also be very interesting in the in the lung epithelial um, realm to, since many of the vesicles are coming from lung, lung epithelium, to see whether they are secreted at specifically by bronchial epithelium or perhaps by type 2 pneumocytes, which are kind of known as secretory cells, um, and they have lots of secretory functions in the lung. So um, I think both of those could be really interesting and valuable. Would you expect to see anything from CTLs? Uh, from CTLs? So, so we don't generally think this is a process uh, allergic inflammation generally is a process driven more by CD4 positive T helper cells, uh, although mm -hmm. we see a small number of CD8 cells. So probably in this model system, n not, but it would potentially be interesting to look in other model systems in the lung, perhaps recruitment to uh, tumors that have metastasized to the lung. You may see large CTL responses and whether those are secreting vesicles that are important in shaping either the local immune response or tissue response to the tumor. 
Thank you. Okay, with no other questions, uh, Heather, thank you again. I'm sure Heather, Heather would be happy to uh, take any questions uh, if you want to send her an email. So thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you, Heather. Thank you.